There are no individual things that I would say anybody should not eat. Now, what I would say is don't eat things that make you feel bad. It's, it's actually, if you were just to do that, it, that, that is, uh, is gonna be very useful. Meaning that if you eat even a nutritious food, right? So- Hey, 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 welcome back to another episode of the Not Almost There podcast. I am your host, Joe Chura, and we have a treat for you today. Mike Matthews is in the house. He is an author, fitness evangelist, podcaster, and entrepreneur. Mike operates with the belief that every person can achieve the body of his or her dreams. He is the best-selling author of the books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, and The Shredded Chef, which combined have sold over 1.5 million copies. Mike is also the host of the Muscle for Life podcast, as well as the founder of Legion Athletics, a phenomenal supplement company, one that I use and you need to check out. Mike has used his simple and science-backed approach to fitness and health, building muscle, losing body fat, and gaining strength to help thousands of people across the world achieve their best bodies ever. In this episode, Mike explains the importance of some key factors to ensure great and healthy training, which include getting proper sleep, understanding the food you eat, and the importance of building good habits. He also talks about the supplements to take if you're interested in enhancing your workout regimen. And, and, Dan, there's one more thing, the one and only true biohack. So get on those shoes, get in the gym while you listen or watch this one. We cover almost everything you need to know to get started on your fitness journey. Keep sending your feedback, and I look forward to seeing you on the other side. So, Mike, thanks for being here today on the Anonymous There podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you've talked to thousands of clients over the years. You've been doing this in terms of uh, being a fitness uh, enthusiast and health en- enthusiast and an expert. Um, you've answered, I heard you send another podcast, like 120,000 emails from oh, people more. asking I questions. Mean, yeah, yeah, this was probably a couple of years ago. Although sure it's, actually it's, it's the total. So I think my inbox is now over 200,000 sent and received actually. So yeah. it's hard to say, but a it's lot, amazing a lot of track of that. Yeah. Well, it's Gmail. I can't, it's just, <laughs> you know, so I, I see the big number. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. Uh, what, what is it that people get wrong when it comes to, overall health and working out diet kind of all of it combined is there something that sticks out that's very thematic from most conversations yeah i mean what immediately comes to mind and now i'm speaking to obviously people who have yet to figure out what works for them and really turn this into a sustainable lifestyle right because what do intermediate and advanced weightlifters get wrong well that's different it's different than just you know the the person who is still struggling with their body composition let's say right who is still struggling to lose x number of pounds and keep it off and um there there are two things one is kind of an all or nothing mentality right where people get very fired up and they hop on to some trend kind of the flavor of the month diet or uh which which is going to be something restrictive almost always right so the, the keto diet all right now they can't eat basically any of the foods that they like anymore. And they're supposed to um, also heavily restrict their calories, even though that may not be explicitly part of the diet. But when you cut out most of the things that you like to eat, that's usually what happens is your calories go way down. And then maybe they couple that with like some sort of kind of hardcore 30 day fitness challenge, which takes them from zero miles an hour to 100 miles an hour very quickly. And they burn out, they burn out with the diet because no matter how resilient somebody is, we all have our breaking point, right? Uh, Some of us may be able to suffer through something longer than others to achieve a goal, but uh, eventually if, if just take, take, take a diet. If you don't like generally the foods that you're eating, if you don't look forward to your meals, if your diet doesn't fit your your food preferences and your lifestyle and your schedule, then 
you will not be able to follow it over the long term. It's just maybe maybe you'll be able to hold out for a long time. Maybe you'll be able to go six months and maybe you will lose a lot of weight, but eventually you're going to get a taste of the foods that you're not supposed to eat or your 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 resolve is, is going to flag, especially if you've made progress. I've seen that a lot where people, they do eventually, they lose weight and then they start to loosen the reins a little bit because it is very uncomfortable. It's not enjoyable to follow this diet that they're following, for example. And then uh, without understanding the real fundamentals of dieting and of the metabolism and energy in and energy out and macronutrients and micronutrients, they don't really know what to do from there. So they're no longer quote unquote dieting. What do they do? They go back to what they were doing previously because that's all they know. And that's, that's a common problem with fad diets is there, there is no off ramp, so to speak. You're either kind of like all in doing it or you're not doing it. And uh, very few people can just all in do it indefinitely. And uh, on the training side of things, similarly, if you jump into a program that is too much too fast, sure, you can get results, but you're always sore and you fall behind in recovery and you start to hate your workouts and that doesn't work in the long term. So something I often talk about is uh, you don't need to be perfect with any of this, you just have to get the most important things mostly right most of the time. So that's important that you don't need this kind of hardcore all in all or nothing mentality. In fact, that, that that's counterproductive. Uh, it's, it's just, it's not realistic to expect perfect uh, ever really, or expect even great consistently. If you think about times you were great when you were performing greatly at something, whether it's fitness related or work related, Think of how much energy that required and how much attention that required and how, you, how exhausted maybe you felt afterwards. So it's not realistic to expect that of, our, of ourselves all of the time. And then, and then on the training side of things, um, there, there's also something to be said. Well, I guess this applies to both diet and training. There's something to be said for it needs to be enjoyable and it needs to be actually enjoyable. Not, not something that you, that you try to like, you know, tell yourself you love this straight jacket that you've put on and it's actually not that bad and you didn't really need your arms anyway. No, no, you actually need to enjoy it. Meaning let's take diet, right? Um, the, the majority, I mean, I would say really actually every meal is something that sh you should enjoy. You should be eating foods that you like every meal. Now, can every meal be like hot dogs and bacon and pizza and stuff? No, that, that's not a, that's not a nutritious diet, right? Can you have hot dogs though? I mean, if you loved hot dogs, could you have a hot dog every day? Sure. Could you have a hamburger every day? Sure. Nothing wrong with that. Could you have a uh, pizza every day? Yeah, but maybe a slice. And that might not be like, you, you can't have a large pizza every day and have a, have nutritious diet. Right. But my point with saying that is when no foods are off limits because they're quote unquote bad, which is the, uh, the wrong reference uh, it's the wrong framework to even view food in. Uh, food is not good or bad. It simply is more or less nutritious. And no individual food can make you overweight. No individual food can make you unhealthy. Um, and so you can eat uh, plenty of carbs if you like carbs. You can eat plenty of whole grains, lots of nutrition there, fruit, vegetables, of course, legumes, seeds, you have all kinds of things to choose from. Um, and, and there are many sources of, of fat that you can enjoy. You have saturated fat, of course, you have in like meat and dairy, which you don't want to have an excessive amount of, but you can certainly have some. And then nuts are a great source of uh, monounsaturated fat in particular. And so when you have, again, a long list of foods to choose from, it's not that hard to start putting together meals that you like and that you can change up as often as you want and that provide your body with uh, not just calories, but also protein, carbohydrate, and fat in the appropriate amounts and nutrients. And so if your diet is, is not enjoyable, and by, when I say diet, I just mean a regimen for eating, not yeah. necessarily like dieting, quote unquote, to, to lose weight or something, um, then, then you should change something. And that's one of the reasons why I advocate for flexible dieting is, uh, it, it, and the rules are very simple for flexible dieting. It's you have to pay attention to your calories. You have to know where your calories should be and why. And you have to pay attention to your macronutrients, the major nutrients your body needs, protein, carbohydrate, and fat are the key ones we're looking at here. And then 
You have to eat foods you like. You have to. That's part of it. And those foods are, are off limits. And so long as you're getting to the final rule or guideline is so long as you're getting the majority of your calories from nutritious foods that are relatively unprocessed, you can take a minority of your calories. We could keep it simple and say 80-20. And you can give those over to whatever you want to eat. It doesn't matter. It, it can be the most non-nutritious, highly processed. It could just be candy, right? It's hard to get quote unquote junkier than candy or like, you know, uh, uh, tricks, like some just kind of garbage breakfast cereal, right? Um, whatever, whatever you like to, whatever you like to eat just as an indulgence, you don't have to eat those foods. Uh, some days, maybe you won't even feel like it, then don't. And some days you'll want to, then do it. And that approach to dieting works very well for people because it's a sustainable lifestyle. It's something that doesn't require any willpower to stick with beyond when you're trying to lose fat, yeah, restricting your calories uh, is not fun per se, but if you do it the right way, it's not grueling either. And the same principle applies to training. You should enjoy your training program. You should enjoy your workouts. You're not going to enjoy every workout. You're not going to look forward to every one, but you'll always, uh, you should always have enjoy, you should enjoy having worked out, right? Your workouts shouldn't be so uh, long or intense that you are leaving the gym exhausted and uh, in hurting. Uh, you should you should end your workouts feeling like you exerted yourself, but you should also still have energy and you shouldn't be in pain anywhere. And generally speaking, that's that should also be kind of like the uh, the um, the flavor of your programming should be you're working hard but you're also recovering and you're never getting too sore and you're not running into repetitive stress injuries because of you know trying to squat five days per week with heavy weights, for example. And again, you should generally say, yes, I like my training and I usually look forward to it. And um, yeah, so I know I'm kind of rambling at this point, but uh, I think that that's useful information for people who need to hear it, you know? Yeah, so it's uh, to kind of sum up some of this stuff. It's too much, too fast. Like when you, um, I, a quote uh, I had Alex Hutchinson on uh, last or a few weeks back. By the time this airs, and you know he he says people often overestimate what they can do in the short term, but underestimate what they can do in the long term. Right. So, so too much, too fast. That's 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 pretty obvious, and I see that happen a lot. Fads or flavors of the week or month there's bound to be a new diets popping up make sure it's enjoyable and that the 80 20 kind of Pareto principle if you're doing this 80 percent of the time you're going to probably be in a good spot yep and if yeah. and if you pay attention particularly to the fundamentals which is the 20 percent that gives you the 80 percent you could ignore most everything else if not everything else depending on what your goals are and be no worse for it. Be able to achieve yeah. your goals, have the body you want that looks and performs and feels the way that you want without, I mean, that, that's really what I've tried to achieve with, with my books. Like I've tried to make bigger, leaner, stronger for men, thinner, leaner, stronger for women. The, the, the book for, let's take the men's book, right? Most guys I've worked with over the years from where they start to get the look they want, they need to gain call it 30 pounds of muscle, give or take some. Um, and they want to get their body fat down to 10 to 15% in that range. And that's it. Like that is their goal body. That is their beach body. That's their dream physique. And if they could just get there and maintain that, then that'll be uh, something that they don't have to, they're, they're not going to put any more energy into trying to figure out, for example, how to gain the, the remaining 10 pounds of muscle that is genetically available to them. They just don't care. Or they don't want to learn how to get down to 5% body fat or 4% body fat so they can step on stage. Because yeah, you do need to know a bit more to do those things than what's in Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. Um, and so the Bigger, Leaner, Stronger which I'm, I'm actually going through a, a round of updates on, and, I, and I've done that several times now, I, I really intend for that to be the book that for, uh, I'd say for, for most guys getting into fitness who want to achieve what I just described, that they don't need anything else. It's all in that book. And if they want to learn more just because they like it and they're looking to optimize their results further, of course, there's more to learn. Uh, but, you know, that's... Um, 
that that's been my goal since the since the beginning is here are the things that really matter and and everything else it's not that it doesn't matter it's just not part of that 20 percent. you know it is science-based and one thing that i wanted to um touch on regarding diet and um tracking and macros is protein because once you start and you put in the macros that you should be eating clearly the deficit that most people have is in protein and they have too yep. high fat, too high carbs. They're hitting their, their calorie, their overall calories maybe, but that, that protein is, is so that like low. half of where it should yeah, be. It's like, yeah. it's like half. And I, I've seen that over and over again. And that was my issue too, that when you're, I guess, kind of going back to how to, how to figure all of that out. So one is um, your resting metabolic rate. That's kind of your baseline, right? Can you explain that a little bit and how someone can figure out what their resting metabolic rate is? So it's the, just the number of calories that you burn in a 24 hour period, uh, just doing your normal day to day activities, no vigorous acti- no vigorous physical exercise, for example, like basal uh, metabolic would be just lying in a bed all day. Uh, RMR allows for a little bit of moving around basically. And what many people don't realize is that uh, BMR and RMR are usually very similar in terms of like bottom line numbers, but there is a slight distinction there. But, but either of those actually comprises the majority of the calories, the majority of the energy that we burn every day. It's just burned by our organs to stay alive. Um, unless you are extraordinarily active. I mean, I'm talking about like if you do hours and hours and hours of exercise every day, okay, fine, that's different. Um, but for those of us who maybe do four to six hours of exercise a week, maybe a little bit more, um, the probably about 70 to 80 percent, certain let's just let's just say 60 to 80 percent of our total calories burned. Again, it's just our body staying alive. Our brain, for example, requires a lot of energy just to keep working. I believe if I remember, um, uh, there was some research on this, I believe it was about 20% of, of RMR was just our brain. Um, I think I'm remembering that correctly. And so you take, you take that and then you add on top of that physical activity and now you have your total daily energy expenditure. And it's important, like you said, to understand what your RMR is again, because um, let's say you're a guy, you're and like my RMR is probably about 2,200 calories a day, maybe 2,250 or something like that. And then I lift weights for about an hour a day, five days a week, and I do 30 minutes of low intensity. I guess you could say maybe it's moderate intensity cardio, uh, five to seven days a week. And so on average, my total daily energy expenditure is about 27 or 2,800 because I'm fairly active. If I were to cut my cardio back, it'd probably go down to about 26, which is kind of in line with what I was just explaining. And for people who want to know what their numbers look like, I mean, the easiest thing I'd say is just use a tool. Like if you go to legionathletics.com, that's my website. And then if you go to learn on the menu, there's a drop down, and, and you can select tools and you'll find a, a BMR calculator, a basal metabolic. We have that. I don't think we have RMR yet, but we'll be adding it. And I mean, it's it, essentially, it's the same outcome, but some people are, are searching specifically for uh, resting metabolic. So we might as well yeah. give them that. Um, and then, and then there's also a total daily energy expenditure calculator that will give you an idea of how many calories you're burning. And, and if that's, if somebody hasn't done that before, they may be surprised when they compare that to the calories in a lot of the foods they like to eat. Like you were saying, high carb, high fat, low protein, and um, what they would have to do to bring their po- protein up and bring their carbs and fat down to, to the portions that they eat, for example, and even certain foods. It's not that you quote unquote, can't eat certain foods, but when you start to learn about the calories and the macros in certain foods, you realize that they're, they're not worth the hassle, basically. They're not worth, like take pizza, right? I believe a slice of pizza is probably around 300 calories or so, a slice. And so putting a large pizza over, you know, over a thousand calories, and if you load it up, it could be 2000 plus calories. And so you quickly realize that, okay, I could eat pizza every day, but is one slice of pizza even worth it? No, it's, I mean, I I wouldn't, that's not fun for me, right? Uh, I mean, maybe I guess if my kids are eating pizza, maybe I grab one. But if I was really wanting to have pizza, it's kind of like ice cream. I don't really enjoy ice cream unless I can eat at least half of the pint. Probably the whole thing is what, that, that, that makes a big difference for me. Like eating a quarter pint of ice cream 
I don't get much satisfaction from that. I'd actually rather take those calories and put them into dark chocolate. That's more satisfying to me. And um, so anyways, that's one of the reasons why it's helpful to understand numbers. And, and I should probably mention that in case you haven't mentioned this or in case anybody listening is afraid that um, this is going to turn into kind of a rigmarole where they're constantly having to track calories and weigh and measure everything. You don't need to do that. It's it's a good exercise actually to go through for a period of time just to understand how uh, calories relates to your body composition. So to ensure that you're maintaining a calorie deficit, for example, if you want to lose weight, because the first time you do that, I'm sure you remember, and you see it working consistent, consistently, it's a bit of a, like an epiphany. I remember it myself where I was like, really? It's really this easy? <laughs> right. Like, this is it. I just have to like make sure I, I don't eat too much of the stuff I already like to eat. I just have to portion this stuff out and I can get shredded. You know what I mean? Like, and that, that to me was like a revelation. So it, it's, it's important to have that, that uh, moment uh, and, and tracking calories and macros or just tracking macros. If you do that, then your calories work out anyway, is, is useful for reaching that. Uh, and, and, you may or may not need to weigh and measure food, but doing that again is not a bad idea because if you do it for a bit, you learn portion control. You start to get an idea of what appropriate portions of food look like. And so then when you come on the other end of experiencing the uh, transformative power of track of, of energy balance and using it to, to your advantage, macronutrient balance, particularly protein, high protein intake, you, you're, you're, you notice more muscle tone almost immediately. People notice this, like within the first month of increasing protein intake, people notice more muscle tone, more strength in the gym, better results in the gym, sometimes uh, even better fat loss, like I had mentioned, um, and, and, and other effects, possibly even sleep related effects, but there's a point where you become sold on it. Oh, also I should mention a lot less hungry. So better appetite control. Mm -hmm. And so now you're sold on the high protein, you get that. And now you understand also even what it feels like to eat certain amounts of calories that helps. And so you do all that stuff and then you shift to a more intuitive style of eating where you're not following a meal plan per se, you're not tracking or, 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 or measuring anything, but because of the experience that you had doing those things, you're able to uh, eat intuitively very effectively. It works really well for maintenance. That's what I do. For example, I don't, I, I tend to eat the same stuff every meal, every day because they're foods that I like and I'm busy and I don't really care to put much time, effort, thought into food these days. So it's very easy for me to just make my salad. So I'll have like a protein shake uh, before or after I train with a banana. And then I'll have a salad at lunch with chicken and I make my own dressing and blah, blah, blah. I might throw some other stuff in there. And then I'll have some protein powder in the afternoon just to get some more protein in with some fruit somewhere like some blueberries or strawberries. And then for dinner, I have a bunch of vegetables and I'll have um, some meat of some kind. And then uh, after dinner, a little bit later, I like to have some carbs before I go to bed. I, I do oatmeal, so it'll be usually a, a cup of dry and I'll cook it, a cup of dry oatmeal, put some nuts in it for some extra healthy fat. And then there might be a couple little you know, bites of things here and there, some dark chocolate, maybe some extra fruit. And I kind of just do the same thing every meal, every day, and it works for me. Uh, but uh, if I wanted more variety, I have enough experience again, tracking, measuring, planning to know if I want to swap foods out, what appropriate portions look like for the foods I want to swap in. So it just makes it very easy and um, the, kind of like low cognitive overhead to maintain the body composition that I want. What's the significance of eating before bed? Um, a couple of things. One, uh, there's, there's some research that shows that it can improve sleep and carbs in particular. Now, if you have too big of a meal, it can have the opposite effect, but going to bed on an empty stomach can disrupt sleep, uh, especially if you get hungry in the middle of the night. And again, there's some research that shows that some carbs in particular can, can improve sleep quality. And I, I used to be a, a champion sleeper. Like when I was in my mid to late twenties before I had kids, I mean, I, dude, I would work all day. And I'd, I, I would, let's see, I'd come home, um, I would do fasted cardio, I'd have some caffeine and yohimbine at like 7 p.m. I would do cardio, eat some food, go back to work, work until, I don't know, maybe like 11.30, um, get ready for bed, 
in bed by 11.45 maybe, fall asleep within five minutes, blackout unconscious for six and a half hours, maybe six hours and 45 minutes, wake up naturally without an alarm and that's it. And, and then go about my day. And I, and I did that for five or six years with no symptoms of sleep deprivation or like that was just, that worked. Um, but then I had kids and I got older. <laughs> Gotta love kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got older and that those days are long gone. Dude, it, it is, I, I will sleep through the night once every two months, maybe, yeah. uh, and not wake up once. And, and so uh, when I'm sleeping well now, I'll wake up at least once, maybe twice, but once is like a guaranteed, right? So I'll wake up and you know something that, that works for me and this, this, uh, this may, this may be in line with some genetic factors. My parents aren't great sleepers. I've gotten some genetic testing done in the, in the past and uh, that indicated that I tend to be, uh, I guess I'm, I have like, uh, uh, I'm prone to, to anxiety. And fortunately, I don't experience anxiety, but I am a higher strung person. So I, like, it takes a little bit for me to, to relax to the point of getting sleepy, right? So I've learned that. And then also uh, there was something related to the metabolism, not the production, but the metabolism of yohim, uh, sorry, yohim bean, of melatonin. And mm-hmm. so what has worked really well for me, and this is a tip for anybody who, again, if your problem, my problem in the past has been staying asleep, not falling asleep, right? So a bad night, I haven't had this in a while, but a bad night would be like waking up every hour, hour and a half. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So what has helped for me, aside from just managing stress and taking some time to relax at the end of the day and make sure that I am sleepy and that I'm kind of like switched off by the time I go to bed, um, has been when I'll wake up in the middle of the night, I'd say I've been sleeping three hours or so, I'll wake up and then I'll take uh, slow acting melatonin in particular works well for me. I believe it's three to five milligrams. Um, I'll take one and then that usually will just keep me asleep until my alarm. So that's a good night's sleep now. And, uh, so that's, that's, uh, in the past, again, I, I, that wasn't, that wasn't an issue, but, um, you know, now it is. And so I've tried many different things to improve sleep, many different supplements, um, bedtime routines, all kinds of shit. Just name something. I've tried it. If it's natural, I haven't tried drugs cause I don't want to go down that road. Those drugs yeah, you they just want, knock you out. Like, yeah, you yeah. don't want to become dependent on them. Actually, like they're right. they're pretty pretty bad for your body. Actually, so I I don't want to do that. But I've tried everything else, and one of the things that has helped me is a, a higher, not like a very high carb, but a higher carb meal at the end of the night, like about an hour before I go to bed. And I also I put some walnuts in that, so it, it digests even slower. And um, yeah, those are the two things that have stuck. Is so is it that? just like a, a cup of oatmeal, dry, and I and I and I, and I cook it, and, put some and water I, in it, yeah, yeah, I put some water and I cook it, and I put nuts in it, and then I'll put a little bit of maple syrup and a little bit of milk, and it reminds me of my childhood. I used to eat that all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but uh, it's also, I mean, there's there's one or two servings of whole grains. I, I I would argue oatmeal is probably the best single whole grain we can eat in terms of health benefits, and so it also is serving that purpose as well which I I pay a lot of attention to the individual foods that I eat simply because I'm really trying to optimize my, my diet and my training and my lifestyle in general to give me as much performance as I can get. I'm more, I'm more interested in energy levels and, and cognitive performance. Like my gym, I still enjoy my workouts, but the reality is there's there's not much muscle left for me to, to gain, period. Um, uh, in this video, people are gonna be like, does this dude even lift? Go look at my Instagram. I'm not saying I have an amazing physique, but I lift. <laughs> and uh, and I got that recently. Uh, not that I care, I think it's funny, I understand. Because uh, you can't see, you're just like, oh, what? He doesn't look massive. Right. <laughs> so, you know, he doesn't, he obviously doesn't even lift. Um, but, but so I've gained about probably 40 pounds of muscle total since I started lifting, maybe a little bit more. And that's, that's basically it as far as my genetics go and my skeleton goes. It doesn't matter this point, at, from this point on, it doesn't matter what I do in the gym other than steroids. I am not going to get significantly bigger. And so I still enjoy my training. And now I'm really just trying to eke out. M- small improvements in performance and just enjoy my, 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 um, workouts and not get hurt. And so the game changes a little bit in that regard. Um, but I, I feel like I, I kind of demand a lot from my, my body. Uh, I wake up fairly early. So I'm up at about six, maybe a little bit earlier. 
and I start the day reading. So I'll read for 45, 60 minutes or so. I have an infrared sauna and I go in there and just read. And then I'm uh, up and I go to the gym. So I work out and then I'm working until I take a short break to make myself lunch and bathroom breaks. Do you work and- out fasted? No, no. Um, I, I, I think it's a good idea if you combine that with your himbine and caffeine, if you're cutting and you're lean and you want to get leaner because that combo can, can help you burn fat and particularly the, the hard to lose bits of fat, the, the quote yeah. unquote stubborn fat. But the, the downside to fast training for, for most everyone is you take a bit of a performance hit, even if mm. you add those supplements in, in some people, the supplements counteract the, the performance uh, hit. And it, it also depends on your carbohydrate intake. So let's say you're cutting, you're deeper into a cut, you're not low carb, but you're lower, of course, than you would like to be instead of eating 350, 400 grams of carbs a day. If you're a guy, you're eating half of that, uh, your glycogen levels are lower and you need that glycogen to power through a lot of your weightlifting, unless you're just doing like bare bones powerlifting training, if you're doing any sort of hypertrophy work, if you're doing anything over, let's say six reps ever on any exercise, you need glycogen to really drive that. So if your glycogen levels are low and you have not provided your body with some glucose, like eating some carbs before you train, if you're fasted, you're going to have a shitty workout. It just is what it is. Um, so, so no, I don't, I don't do that. Um, but you know, yeah, then I'm working and go ahead. Yeah. I typically wake up at 520, at 5.25, I'm taking a pre-workout drink, coffee, yep. straight downstairs. I work out for an hour. It's normally weight training. Um, okay. So it's like lower reps and yep. uh, do that. And then I, cu- I and then after that, I have a post-workout smoothie um, yep. with like blueberries, bananas, same, pretty much the same thing you have in, in uh, two scoops of protein, which is about 45 to 50 grams. Yep. Is that yeah, you may, a, you may, there's nothing wrong with that um, at all. You may be surprised at how much of a difference it would make in your training. H- how many carbs are in that smoothie approximately? Like 50 ish? Yeah, I think so. I, I have a couple blueberries. I have a banana, some yeah. kale. Yeah. So around that. All my yeah, probably 50 ish. Yeah. You, you, you might be surprised at how big of a difference it can make if you had that before you train. It's so like if you had it mm. 30 minutes or so before, just so you've given your body a little bit of time to process. Um, if we really wanted to, to micromanage, I would say uh, some fructose as well as something starchy. That's just a really good source of, of um, glucose. But, but that, that, that's probably not that important. If you were to have that smoothie though, wake up, have your smoothie uh, with everything else, which may blunt the caffeine a little bit. So it depends, like it'd be the protein sometimes does that for me at least, but you'd have to see that may make a, a pretty significant difference in your, in your workouts. And then what you could do is you wouldn't have to rush to eat after you train. Um, you could wait an hour or so and have another scoop of protein. And the reason being again is um, having, having carbs for you train that alone influences performance. And if you're going to have the carbs, you might as well have the protein. Uh, yeah. But if you were, if you were cutting and you were taking caffeine and your himbean, then I would say, yeah, keep doing that. And just know that, it, you know, that you, you are sacrificing a little bit of the, the performance to, to speed up the fat loss. Um, but, but anyways, the reason why, again, I pay attention to a lot of the details of how I eat and what I do is I feel like I, I demand a lot from my body. So I'm trying to give it every little thing, like instead of just eating, um, vegetables, like uh, good rule of thumb, at least three servings, uh, five servings is better fist size. That's a serving of vegetables per day. Right. And you pick the vegetables, go for it. And if you do that, that's the 20% as far as vegetable intake goes, that gives you the 80%. Right. But if you want to go further, you could say, okay, so you want to make that even better. Make sure you're getting at least one serving of leaf, dark leafy greens per day because of certain compounds and things that are in those that are particularly beneficial. Um, spinach is my go-to. That's also easy to put into a smoothie, for example. It does barely even changes the taste. You just throw a serving of spinach in there with the, everything else. And you're also getting a couple servings of fruit, so that's perfect. Blueberries is a fruit in particular because of the pigment, the anthocyanins. I eat blueberries every day for that reason. Um, I have garlic every day. I actually, I actually basically have it raw because you're gonna get the best benefits from, from raw garlic. And I, I eat cruciferous vegetables every day uh, because of some compounds that can help with uh, hormone profile. Again, this is a minor effect. It's not a testosterone booster. I don't want to oversell it. Um, but I, I really try to take my nutrition and my training 
as far as I want to, it's almost OCD. Not, it's not, I'm not neurotic about it, but I've just planned it out because I don't, because I like eating all that stuff. I'm like, eh, I might as well. I might as well, you know, uh, kind of carefully pick every little thing that I'm doing. Um, because again, I'm trying to, I feel like for, for some time now, um, I've, I, I, I'm pushing myself to, to my physical limits in terms of when I go too far is when my sleep starts going to shit. For example, that's become a reliable indicator that I'm just yeah. taking on too much between the workouts and the work and everything else, you know? Are, are there things you stay away from? Like, uh, like I've heard mixed feedback on nightshade vegetables as an example. Like, do you steer clear of anything or uh, how do you approach no, that? No, because, and, and here's a good rule of thumb. There's, there's so much bad information out there about, like if you go listen to um, uh, Stephen Gundry, if you were to read his Plant Paradox books book, which I've criticized uh, on my blog and podcast, then you would believe that you couldn't eat all kinds of vegetables because of the lectins and you couldn't eat certain legumes and you could only eat them if you process them in the special way or take his special supplements. Right. And there's a lot of that out there. If you look at Tom Brady's diet, um, it's even wackier than that. You know, you're not supposed to eat like strawberries and tomatoes and other things. And, and, and I don't even mean that as a criticism of Tom Brady. I'm actually just, I don't care about sports, but I'm just a fan of him as a human for multiple reasons. Um, he just, he just, he doesn't know that shit. He knows how to play football and he has right. people who purport to know that shit. I think honestly, funny enough with Tom Brady, what he discounts, because um, he, he could be very different than his persona, but if his persona is at least partially accurate, um, he seems like a pretty down to earth guy. I mean, he's very competitive, but he doesn't seem like he loves himself excessively. I don't, I think he discounts that he's just Tom Brady. Like, it's not that you don't eat the tomatoes and the, and the strawberries and you have like a, a weird diet that um, that's not why your body has been so resilient and why you're still playing professional football at 42. You're just, you're just a freak. That's it. You're Tom Brady. And there are right. millions of other guys out there who could follow <laughs> that diet and they couldn't even play on the weekend flag football team at your age. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and he's anyway, the goat. so he's the goat for a reason. Cause he's Tom Brady. That's yeah. What it comes down part, to. Part, yeah. Part, yeah. That, that's that, that is probably at least half of, of the X factor. Right. Um, and which is, which which plays into what you were talking about earlier. Like science can only take you so far. You know, if you break yes. down Tom Brady, you, you probably wouldn't equate that to a quarterback that's that can do what he's done. But it's Tom Brady. It's the Tom Brady factor. You know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And, and 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 that that um, that applies to, to I'd say all, all disciplines. I mean, you look in business, and there are people who are they just they they just have it's like they have extra gears that other people just don't have. And yeah. they're able to, they're repeat offenders. They're, they're not, they didn't just get lucky one time. They, they do one thing, make a bunch of money. And then they go do something else. Oh, that goes really well too. And then they do it again and they do it again. And they're able to do things that sometimes just defy the odds, right? They're able to, to go into a situation where, with a 5% chance of winning and somehow figure out a way to win. And, and, and so um, anyway, that's, that's a, a, a another discussion, but my point back to your, back to what you're saying is there, there are no individual things that I would say anybody should not eat. Now, what I would say is don't eat things that make you feel bad. It's, it's actually, if you were just to do that, it, that, that is, uh, is going to be very useful. Meaning that if you eat even a nutritious food, right? So for example, uh, my wife doesn't do well with, with turkey and peas. Like they actually upset her stomach. So why? I don't know. Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> they, 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 they don't sit well with her, so she doesn't eat them, right? So she just finds other things that, that she can eat. And so take something like gluten, for example. The vast majority of people can process gluten just fine. You don't, you don't, your default position should not be, oh, I have a gluten sensitivity. Your default position should be, I don't until, until proven otherwise, right? But if you find that when you eat uh, gluten-containing foods or maybe certain gluten-containing foods, you get gassy and your, your stomach hurts and uh, maybe you even get a little bit lethargic, then you can simply just avoid those foods and you really don't have to take it any further than that if you don't want to try to figure out why. And, 
and I understand, um, I, I probably wouldn't unless it were really a problem and maybe it's a food I really wanted to eat or maybe there were too many foods that I couldn't eat. Then it's time to start digging in further. But if it's just the odd thing, eggs also generally don't sit well with my wife. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but it's just not a, you know, it's, it's, so she finds the stuff that she can eat. And, I, and that, that's what I do myself. I tend to have, I don't know, a steel trap, just acid pit stomach. Uh, so, yeah, but if I think, are there any, I also, I, I don't, I don't kind of venture too far from the foods that I like and I've been eating for a long time. Nothing immediately comes to mind where I, where it's clear. Like, That's good. Yeah. Do yeah. not eat that. What, what uh, my, my experience though, I, I have experienced that if I eat. So for example, my wife is German and I've been to Germany many times and I don't do this anymore because I, I don't have any urge to anymore. I, I just lost the desire. But anybody who's been to Germany knows that their bread is very, very good. Their dairy products, very, very good. Uh, I hear the beer is, I don't drink, so I don't know. But when I would go to Germany, I would eat, my diet would go to shit basically. So I would make sure I get enough protein, which half of that would just be protein powder. Um, so it'd be, it'd be protein powder and meat. And so like breakfast, I would eat a pile of bread and cheese and quark, which is um, kind of like a Greek yogurt kind of stuff and jelly. And, and then I would not be hungry for like six hours out of some protein shakes in there, maybe a little bit of fruit. And then dinner would just be your typical German stuff, uh, meat and potatoes and sauces and shit. And I could, I could do that for about, oh, I don't know, like seven days, maybe 10 days until my body was just like begging for, I actually was craving vegetables at that point. Uh, just did not feel good anymore. And, and so, you know, I could imagine um, having a similar reaction maybe to, to, to foods. And again, if somebody has a reaction like that, or they just, there's some sort of, yeah, just stay away from them. Just stay away yeah. from it. I mean, why bother? Yeah. So I, I want to go back to sleep in a second, but I want to kind of follow up on macros. I know in the, in your book, you recommend, um, like a fixed percentage of macros for protein, carbs, and fat. Does that fixed percentage, does it vary? Is there a scale between different types of people? Like the, the person that's really looking to get cut, to get shredded, or the person looking to maintain, or, or maybe the, the person looking to do an endurance race. Should you look at those in a different way, or do, you, do they all kind of fall in that same line that you have outlined? Yeah, yeah, good question. That's actually something I'm going to be changing slightly in this next round of updates. I'm going to I'm going to keep protein very fixed because that really should just be fixed based on what you're doing, and I'm going to recommend pl a place to start. So what's in the book right now, if 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 it doesn't make it clear right now, I, I don't think it does that if you're not sure what works for you, just start here. Like here's what works for most people, right? A pretty balanced diet, 30 to 40% of calories from protein, 30 to 40 from carbs, 30 ish, uh, can be up or down depending on your protein and carbs from fat. And that said, if you know, you like very high carb, for example, um, like if you are doing a, a lot of exercise, especially a lot of endurance and you're, you're, you're doing the weightlifting, and you respond well to carbs, then you may want to go 30% protein, especially if you're lean bulking, 50 or 60% carbs and like 20 to 25 fats. And because you're eating a lot of calories, you can do that. Or if on the flip side, you understand that low carb dieting is not necessary for improving body composition or even improving health, uh, but you like it. And maybe you like fatty foods more than carby foods. And that just works for you then yeah, you can bring, bring your carbs down as really as low as you want. Although I will say, if you try to get below 15% of daily calories or so, you're almost certainly not going to be able to get in enough nutrition because to get in enough nutrition, most of the nutrients that our body uh, needs, th they come from plant foods. Like I've, I've written and spoken about the carnivore diet, for example, that it's a great elimination diet. Like if you are having problems and you don't know what's going on and you need to strip everything out and go with something that is well tolerated by most everyone. Yeah, that's meat, right? You just eat meat. But the idea is you start adding foods back in. And the idea that you're going to get all of the nutrients you need from meat alone is so dumb. It, it, it's like, <laughs> it's like flat earth level stupidity. It, yeah, it blows my mind that 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 that. I mean, it's marketing. It's, it's sell, marketing. yeah, it sells books. Yeah, it's marketing. That's what it is. It, it's it's yeah. like the the extreme contrarian type of marketing angle, which yeah, certainly can work well. Um, and 
But if we want to go with just the weight of the evidence, we have a lot of research on, on, on the importance of eating plant foods. And we know exactly why. We know the mechanisms. And I, I mean, this is also not a very controversial area of research. We're not talking about climate change here. We're talking about like, what is this? Is this big vegetable trying? Is this a conspiracy that, right. you know, a bunch of fake research to try to convince people to eat more carrots no. Right. And, and I'm actually, and I actually, I, I don't think very highly of people who use the term conspiracy theory unironically because conspiracy is literally the dominant theme of history. Like rich and powerful people have been conspiring since the beginning of time to get richer and more powerful and destroy their enemies and uh, meddle in everyone's lives. And there are so many examples of conspiracy that even modern in, in, in our, in our modern civilization, that, that to think that that is somehow not the case anymore, that we've transcended that part of human nature is, is actually idiotic as well. But I, I don't see again, how I, I've never even heard anybody claim that there was a conspiracy in science to get people to eat more vegetables. Right. So we can probably just right. rule that out and take the scientific evidence at face value. Right. And so if, if we look at that, then we realize that, okay, we just need to be eating plant foods every day. That's really what we need to be doing. And if, again, if your carbs go too low, you're going to struggle to get in those, let's say two, my, my general recommendations are one to three servings of fruit per day and three to five servings of vegetables per day. You can go above those. There's, there are no downsides. If you eat too much vegetables in particular, you might get uh, GI issues, especially in one serving. Like if you try to eat five servings of vegetables in one meal, you might not feel so good. But if you, if you really like vegetables and it just works out to six to eight servings a day, that's fine as well. And um, so if we even go to the low end of that and go, okay, we're going to eat one serving, so one medium banana a day of fruit, not not probably ideal, but not terrible. And we're going to go with three servings of vegetables. Of course, vegetables have calories and carbs too. But even if we try to go with the lower calorie options, again, it's it's hard to do that when you are trying to eat under, let's say, 50 grams or so, 50 to 60 grams of carbs per day. So I'm going to make that clearer in um, in the updated editions of Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, that um, the, the prescriptions that I've given are, are kind of just what work well for most people, but they are negotiable. Whereas protein intake, I would say, is, is non-negotiable if we really want to optimize our health and our results. And when you're tracking, do you recommend a certain app like MyFitnessPal or anything else? Because I know when you wrote the original version of your book, I don't think that was in there because it probably wasn't as popular as it was today, but are, is there anything that you can recommend? Yeah, um, that's that's a good one. A lot of people use it. A lot of money has gone into it. People are familiar. A lot of people are familiar with the the um, the interface just because there are a lot of other apps that have kind of copied it, right? Um, and I personally don't use an app for for tracking because again, it's not necessary. And I and I always have preferred following a meal plan over tracking. And the reason being, um, well, meal planning is tracking, but over using an app because I don't like to make decisions. I don't like to think about what I'm going to eat. I have too many other things to think about. It's just not worth any cognitive bandwidth whatsoever to me. So what I'd rather do is just make a plan that works. The numbers work. I like what's on that plan and just eat that plan until I feel like changing something. And if somebody really likes variation, then what they could do is do that, but start with, let's say, a couple of options for the meals that they want variation in. So instead of the one breakfast, okay, have three. That you Again, you've worked out the numbers work, pick whichever one you want, A, B, or C. And then the same thing could be for lunch or dinner. In working with a lot of people, usually if they have some variation for one meal per day, it's often dinner, most people. Most people, they go, I don't really care. I'll do something simple for breakfast or even skip it altogether. I don't give a shit, intermittent fasting. Lunch, it will be a salad, something simple. But for dinner, I would like to be able to choose between things. Um, so I've always been a fan of that method. The tracking with an app on the fly works, of course, um, but it also leads you to deciding, okay, what am I going to eat? Like walking into the kitchen and then mm -hmm. playing around, trying to figure out how much of that can I eat actually? I want to, I want meatballs with blah, but uh, let me look at my app. Uh, I don't really like how that 
plays out. Uh, what about what about chicken with blah and the sauce? Oh, fuck, now the sauce doesn't work. And yeah, I don't like doing that. I'd rather just know this is what I'm eating, make it, eat it, and move on with my day. So that's uh, that's definitely good advice. And and anyone who's hasn't started this, even if you track like a week and you just you follow that pattern, like you, there's no point to keep tracking it. But as long as you follow that same diet, like I'll, I have the same protein shake every day. I have a very similar lunch and my, my dinner varies a little bit, but because I'm doing that, I know I'm generally close. Like, like that's the moral, moral of the story, right? Like, like yep. you've, you found out what works just repeating. Yeah. And, and something just to add to that, um, yep. is that works again, great for maintenance and also can work well for cutting because what I did recently, for example, is I'm in Virginia and I forget when the initial kind of COVID lockdown kicked in, whatever, probably about a year ago now or so, and gyms were closed for a bit. And so uh, I was training at home. I don't really have much of a home setup, but I have some adjustable dumbbells and some bands, good enough to just not lose muscle basically. And and I, I was no longer driving to the office or the gym. And so I was like, eh, I'll just, I'll spend that time doing some low intensity cardio, just burn some calories. There are some additional health benefits to doing some more cardio, particularly cardiovascular benefits. Why not? Right. And so I, I increased my energy expenditure by call it 300 calories a day, 350 calories or so. And I didn't change my meal plan at all. I just kept eating the stuff that was maintaining me at my previous body composition. And so over the course of six to eight months, it, which is how long I did the home workouts for, which was longer than necessary, of course, um, we, we, had, we had good data on, the, on the, the risk profile, I don't know, at least six months. Uh, yeah, probably about six months into it is when it became clear that like, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't, uh, somebody like me, I'm 36, and uh, have no health conditions, and I exercise more than 150 minutes per week, my risk is much, much lower than somebody twice my age, twice my body weight, blah, blah, blah. But I actually liked the time savings of it at the time. I was like, yeah, I don't care to drive to the gym. I'll just keep doing my home workouts until I really feel like I want to go back to the gym. And so over that period, I lost about eight pounds of fat without tracking anything, without weighing anything. I just kind of sticking to my normal meal plan. And so people you know, can, can do that very easily as well. Once you get into that groove, you can increase your energy expenditure like I did. You can just take a meal down, for example, like, oh, I'll just, okay, I'll remove the, the cup of rice. So there's 200 calories or whatever. I'll remove that from my dinner and um, I'll have a little bit of less, I'll have a little bit less of whatever else in, at my lunch. Oh, there's a 350 calorie deficit. There you go. That, that's, um, you can go a bit bigger than that, of course, but that will certainly produce results. And then when you're done cutting, you just go back to what you were, what you were doing previously. So what I did is once I had lost enough fat where I was like, all right, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it here. I don't want to get too lean because that starts to have negative ramifications, uh, in my workouts. And if I go too far with it, then, you know, sex drive goes down and just quality of life goes down if you get too lean as a, as a guy and also as a gal. Um, so what I did is at the end of the cut, I added in more food to account for that deficit because I wanted to keep the cardio in. So I just started eating more and stopped losing fat. In the book, you, you recommended 25% to look in terms of the, the caloric deficit. So going back to the equation that we used earlier, you got your resting metabolic rate, you have your activity levels, then you take off 25% and that's kind of what you should be eating. Is that still in line with what you think today? Yep. Yep. I think that's, again, that's a, uh, you could say an aggressive but not reckless approach. The the caveat would be if there was someone actually, let's say more like like me, right? So let's say somebody who's been lifting weights for a while, they've gained a fair amount of muscle and let's say they're starting a cut relatively lean. Let's say it's a guy, um, 10, 11, 12, 13%, pretty muscular, or it's a woman, 20, 20 21, 22, something like that. And again, somebody, a woman who has gained a fair amount of muscle and strength, um, they can they could start with a 25% deficit, but certainly once that guy gets 
I'd say below 10 and the woman gets below 20, they're probably going to do a little bit better with slightly smaller, maybe something more around 300 calories. Uh, and, and again, it's not a, it's not a major point, but as far as muscle retention goes and just controlling hunger yeah. and energy levels, um, we, we know, for example, research has shown that, that people who are lean and muscular are more likely to lose muscle as they cut. And so I would say that the, uh, the effect size is probably more relevant to bodybuilders as natural bodybuilders less so to just kind of lifestyle bodybuilders, like people like us who just want to look good and be fit. Because let's face it, like, let's say over the course of a cut, you lose a couple of pounds of muscle, not good, not what you wanted to do, of course. Um, but then you come to the end of, your, uh, end of your cut, you've reached your, your target body fat level. Now you're going to raise your calories. Uh, you go back to maintenance you're going to gain that muscle back very quickly. It's going to come back in your first like two weeks anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because of muscle memory, you're just going to gain it right back. It's going to be very fast. Newbie gains real quick, right? And so does it really matter that you lost those couple of pounds? No, it doesn't. Of course, it matters though, if you're a natural bodybuilder, because you have to cut down, get super lean, and then get on stage and be judged about, you know, your, your right. muscularity, right? So that's something to keep in mind too, when people are cutting enough to worry too much about it, what would be bad enough to, it would be catastrophic for us normal people. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but would, would, would be, you know, to, to just eat like 10% of calories from protein and, and a 40% deficit and do a bunch of cardio. If you were to do that for a period of time, yeah, you're going to, you're going to really notice in the mirror. You're going to be like, wow, I look small and flat. That, that was not the, the goal. I was going to ask you about that. So a lot of folks are training and I'm training for an ultra marathon Spartan race. Um, and a lot of folks train for marathons or like longer races. Is there, is there a way to train for something like that and not lose muscle at the same time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, probably not. I, I probably wouldn't say that you can do it without losing any muscle, but you certainly can, can do it in a way that uh, whatever muscle you may lose, you don't, you don't see a big difference, uh, which, which is good, right? Like kind of like what I just described, if you do lose yeah. some along the way, you'll just quickly gain it back and you haven't set yourself way back. And the key there is I think there's some good information. If you go to legionathletics.com, you search for concurrent training. Um, uh, the, my director of content who oversees all of our strategy and also writes and researches, not just under his name, not, not for me, but um, I mean, he'll help sometimes with the initial, like, Hey, I want to put together something on blah. And I have a couple of people who can help at least do some of the initial kind of spade work so I can dive into it. Um, but I believe there's a good article on that. And I actually recorded a podcast where I shared that information as well. But really what it comes down to is as your endurance training is ramping up, you have to taper your strength training down. You just, you don't, what you don't want to try to do do is like when you're deeper into your endurance training, you're doing 10 plus hours per week, for example, you don't want to also be trying to get in the gym and do five or six hours of heavy strength training. Um, and, and so I've, I've worked with people over the years who have done this. And what we've done is I don't remember the exact hour numbers. There were some marathoners. I remember they were getting up there like 20 plus hours a week. And we, we went down to just one or two strength workouts per week, depending on their circumstances. Um, if it was one, it was a full body. We just did the big compounds and it was just to try to preserve strength and preserve muscle. If it was a two, it was an upper lower. And if it was a three, again, this depends on the person and their circumstances, what they're doing. It was either like a uh, three full body or an upper lower upper or the other way around, depending on what they want to work on or a push pull legs. Any of that can work fine. And, um, and then also you have to make sure I mean, protein intake is very important. Uh, make sure that you are, are not in a calorie deficit. Don't use that as a as an excuse to cut because that will make it worse and so often then what people have to do is they have to pay a bit more attention they can't um, be as flexible quote unquote in their caloric intake as what i've been describing where you know i'm eating for for example i, I eat more or less the same amount of calories. It's a range, right? So I'm eating 27 to 2,900 a day. I'm not concerned with 
how many calories I burned that day. My activity levels are pretty um, steady throughout the week. And then on the weekends, I eat a little bit less because I'm a little bit less active. I'm not lifting on the weekends. And that, that's, that's pretty easy, right? But in the case of somebody who is doing a lot of exercise, one, you need to make sure that you're caloric intake, you want to be in maintenance or even a slight surplus if you're okay with that. If you're okay with gaining a little bit of fat over the process, that will help with muscle retention, but minimally try to be in mate in kind of a maintenance mode. And so you might have to do a little bit of work like, you know, using the um, MET is the, is the acronym and, and uh, method of determining. So you take your, your resting metabolic rate and then you use it. What is it? It's the MET metabolic equivalent task, I believe is the acronym. I forget exactly what it stands for, but that method, which you can find info on, on legionathletics.com or elsewhere, it just assigns certain values, activity values, uh, to, to different types of exercise and things that you can, that you do. And so you're able to get very granular and say, okay, I'm swimming this amount of time running, I'm doing biking or whatever. Okay. Here, let me figure out approximately how many calories I'm burning in those workouts specifically. And I'm doing my lifting on these days. Let me add that in. And so your meal plan ideally will shift. Like some days you're going to be eating more than others. And if you're doing it right, you're also taking time to rest. You're not just, sorry, someone's at the door, so my dog. Um, you're taking time to rest too, where, I mean, ideally, right, you're, you're taking probably one day a week off of everything where that's really a recovery day. Yeah. Um, and, and on that day, then you're going to want to bring your calories down. So, uh, and, and, and then sleep, make sure you're getting enough sleep. If you can do it, uh, I would even add in a nap. I'm not one for naps uh, just because I like to stay busy doing things. But if I were in your shoes, I probably would try to make time for a 30 or 45 minute nap in addition to getting enough sleep because it just can make a big difference um, over time in terms of your recovery. Yeah, and on sleep, I, I promise to go back to this. Uh, I. I've been hearing more and more research about the importance of sleep. And I read it in your book too, and wish I read it a long time ago with regards to how, how much it can hurt muscle growth, especially if you're embarking on a new program, you want to kind of get ripped for the summer or whatever reason it is, but you're most people use sleep as a way to get things. I mean, use lack of sleep as a way to get things done to figure out, you know, find more time in, in the day. How important is sleep? I mean, it's the ultimate, it's maybe the only biohack. I don't think very much of uh, the the biohacking, I don't know, it's a movement, I guess you could say. A lot of it is a lot of ado about nothing, basically. I mean, it, we're really talking about um, stuff that is in that 80% that gives you 20% and often stuff that gives you no percent, it's not gonna really do anything. And there's a lot of marketing bullshit um, in, that, in that space. But sleep is a true biohack. Getting enough sleep makes everything better. I mean, it, and it's annoying, it is. And I understand people who, I, I wish I didn't have to sleep. If, the, if there's ever a vaccine that, that uh, gets rid of the need for sleeping, I will sign up for the trial on that one. <laughs> if, if it's going to be that or I'd have to wait 10 years to find out, I may, I may just sign up and be like, yeah, oh, I'll, take, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take the risk. If, if, if this uh, allows me to not sleep and, and not have any physiological effects and just keep going as if I was sleeping, that would be that would be. Well, what's, the, what's the difference between like the six hours that I think most people get versus if someone could, could get eight and the the difference in muscle growth or gains that they could get from those two hours? Yeah, unfortunately, it's a lot. And as uh, as I've gotten older, I've, I've experienced that too. I remember when I was younger, again, I, I generally slept well and I, I got more than six hours on average, but not that much more. But at that time, if I slept poorly and I only slept five hours, I remember it not even impacting me. I remember really not even feeling a difference. I remember sometimes like, you know, five in the afternoon being kind of confused. Like, shouldn't I be tired? I know I, I slept bad, but I feel totally fine. Yeah. I was 25 and I was invincible. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, now I'm 36. And if I sleep five hours, I would feel terrible I'm, by 5 PM. I feel terrible. And that just is what it is. Right. And so six hours is a little bit better, 
but uh, I would be feeling it right now. I would probably be a little bit slower in my thinking and, you know, words wouldn't come as easily and I'm not, I wouldn't be falling asleep. But uh, so there, there are cognitive differences. And as far as performance, it will, it will impair performance in the gym. So that, of course, will reduce muscle gain. It's hard to say how much, but um, let's just say that you are getting um, a few reps less in general with, with any weight because you're not sleeping enough, right? Or, or that progress is just significantly harder to come by. Instead of adding weight to the bar every month, it's every two months or, or every three months because you're not sleeping enough. Uh, or it may just stick you in a rut, especially, that's especially true if you're an intermediate or an advanced weightlifter. If your body's not hyper-responsive to this stuff anymore, like it is in the beginning, sleep now, I mean, every little thing becomes... Uh, much more, much more influential, unfortunately, it just does, right? And and the 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 if we talk about diet, right? If you don't sleep enough, which now we're talking about sleep insufficiency, which can be insidious because you're like, well, six hours, not that bad, it's not four, right? Uh, it's not complete sleep deprivation. Sleep insufficiency. There's been research on this. It increases hunger, for example, so that can make it really hard to cut if you're not getting enough sleep because you're just always hungry. Um, um, and it, it also will impact your performance even more. And there are uh, negative effects in terms of your body's muscle building machinery, I guess you could say, right? So you, you have a less anabolic, a more catabolic environment in your body when you're not sleeping enough. There are higher, higher levels of inflammation, and that's also going to impact uh, insulin sensitivity levels, which if those are lower, which would be the case when you're not getting enough sleep, that's bad for, for muscle. I mean, it's bad for your health, but it's also bad for muscle gain. Uh, protein synthesis rates are gonna be lower. And again, these are things that you won't notice in, in the beginning, you may make actually slower progress than you could have, but for your first six months or so, again, your body's so hyper responsive. And if you're young and you're invincible anyway, you know, whatever, yeah, you can get through it. Um, but it, unfortunately it will catch up with you eventually. And it, it, um, I understand the desire to sleep less, to get more done. Yeah. I can say what I've done, uh, to, to not succumb to that is cut out. I mean, I, I don't do, I don't, I don't, I don't have any hobbies really. I just started taking up golf again. Right. But for a while I had no hobbies. I really put no time into socializing. I would just work, work out and whatever free time I had, I would spend it with my family. So I wasn't a complete like derelict dad. Right. But yeah. I was no TV, um, really like no movies, no social media beyond answering DMS, maybe interacting a little bit on my own platforms. Um, and, and now it's, it's similar. I, I put very little time into other things. I have the, I have this golf hobby. I put a few hours a week into that and, uh, maybe a couple of days per week, I'll watch 30 minutes or so of TV at the end of the night and that's it. So, you know, to, to, what I was unwilling to do though is cut back on sleep so I could watch more TV or, Right. I don't, I don't know, spend more time on social media or dick around on the internet. And so and the that, trick is just don't turn it on at night. Like that's, yeah. that's what, that's what helps with me when it's on, then you're just like, you're up, you know, just don't turn it on. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I understand. Or put the sleep timer. Um, yeah, true. The, yeah. The, uh, the one other topic, I know we got to wrap soon. The one other topic that I was really happy to read in your book, because I generally love heavy weights uh, lifting with heavy weights, but doing lower reps. And you were, the whole thing, um, at least your your method, the original version of the book was to kind of follow this like four to five to six reps to uh, three or so sets per exercise. Yeah. And, then, um, and then go from there. And that's going to give you the most amount of gains versus doing like very high reps. Is that still in sync with, with your thinking and what you follow? Yeah, yeah. So- um the the program itself in in BLS and TLS those programs are not going to there're going to be no substantial changes in this round of updates i may tweak a couple exercises uh, but uh, fundamentally i i think it's they're solid like really what they are for people listening to understand if you take your basic kind of push pull legs strength training foundation which is where anyone new to strength training you could you could start with different things but that is a time proven way to start like do enough squatting deadlifting and 
uh, horizontal and vertical pressing per week, and you're going to get bigger and stronger. And if you want to throw in some bodybuilding stuff, some accessory exercises to give some extra volume to some of the smaller, more stubborn muscle groups, uh, a little bit more pec volume for men and some biceps and shoulders, for example, and some triceps. And in, in women, most women are more interested in, in developing their lower body, or let's just say it's going to take more work for them to get the lower body they really want versus the upper body, then we do a little bit more volume for the lower body, for the glutes and so forth. And that's just a, it's a, it's a very workable method. It's a very simple method, uh, which people appreciate. Again, it's a lot of information for people to take in initially. And, and the, the amount of volume per major muscle group is appropriate. It's in line with the latest, I would say, weight of the evidence in terms of like, how much work do you need to do as a beginner to gain the, the most amount of muscle and strength that is possible to gain in your first year or so. And the I, fortunately I had it right all along, not to, I was, I was only going with my understanding of things and also other people, like I had mentioned earlier, reading their stuff, but more evidence has accumulated to show that for example, you don't need to do, if you're new to this, you do not need to do more than nine to 12 hard sets, which is a set taken close to muscle failure per major muscle group per week to maximize muscle and strength gain. You can do more if you just like spending time in the gym, uh, but you're not going to gain. If you literally doubled that as a newbie, you probably burn out or get hurt. But if you could do it, if you're kind of like a genetic freak and you actually could do it, you're probably not going to gain more muscle and strength. Or maybe maybe you would if you are a genetic freak, but, but the average person by doubling that volume is certainly not going to double their results. Uh, research again shows that that's the sweet spot for people who are new. Now, if you couple that also with an understanding that the sweet spot for volume in an individual training session is about the same, about nine to just call it 10, give or take one or two hard sets for an individual muscle group. You, you see that you have a lot of flexibility in your programming now. Like you could just do a body part split, not that you have to, but you actually could and do very well simply because you don't need more volume every week to maximize uh, muscle for your, for your chest, for example. And, and so um, the, that, that program, again, BLS and TLS, those programs, basic push-pull legs with additional volume to hit those targets. I don't see any reason to do anything else. And where the higher rep stuff comes into play is in Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, which is my book and program for intermediate and advanced weightlifters. Now we don't go higher than 10 reps though. And I explain why in the book, I don't think that's very productive and it actually can get dangerous. Like try to do a set of 20 reps of squats or deadlifts close right. to failure. You completely bad lose idea. your form. Yeah. Yeah. Bad idea. Just a bad idea. Just don't yeah. try it. Actually don't do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, not that it can't be done, but I don't do it just cause I, I don't see the reason the risk to reward ratio doesn't make sense to me. Right. Um, so, so in beyond bigger, leaner, stronger though, the training is, is the, the term is periodized, which uh, periodization is simply taking a period of training and focusing on something specific. So it could be high level, like we're focusing on strength or we're, sp we're focusing on hypertrophy or metabolic conditioning or whatever. And in terms of like practically what that means is, a periodized program will have you work in different rep ranges with different loads for different reasons. And the reason why I introduce the primary reason why Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger is periodized is it, uh, Research shows that that style of training is, is probably better for strength gain, particularly in intermediate and advanced weightlifters. The effects have not been seen as clearly in novices. And again, probably for the reason I just gave in that they don't need to, they just don't need to worry about a lot of that stuff. They can, they don't have to do much more than what I just said, squat, deadlift, bench press, overhead press, get in your nine to 12 hard sets per week, keep on adding weight to the bar, which comes very easily, but things eventually slow down. And one, you need more volume now. Now, nine, 10 hard sets doesn't cut it anymore. Now that's a maintenance program. I and mean, it's a little bit better than you need for maintenance, but to break through and continue gaining muscle and strength, you may need 15 hard sets for a major muscle group in a week now. And now you can't do that in one training session because you really should be stopping uh, probably around 10 in an individual training session. So now you have to split those up into two training sessions and 
Also, uh, by working in different rep ranges, you can, a simple way to think of it is you can stimulate your muscles in different ways. You can provide slightly different stimuli for muscle growth that, again, is more useful and actually has a, a noticeable effect in intermediate and advanced weightlifters who have to work way harder for a lot less. That's the theme of uh, <laughs> the last, you know, gaining that last 20% of muscle and strength is you're going to work. I mean, you're going to work probably literally twice as hard as you had to work now because it's going to take longer. You're going to work five times as hard to gain that remaining 20% of muscle and strength that's genetically available to you than you did to gain that first 80%. Three to five times as hard. That, that, that is, that is kind of like golf. Oh God. You know, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> a yeah, lot harder to, to, to improve your strokes when you're, when you're golfing and your handicaps up there. Yeah, exactly. When, you know, going from a, whatever, a, a 20 to a 10 yeah. Yeah. Is, is pretty straightforward. Going from a 10 to a five, less straightforward and a five to a one is, is like trying to gain your last five pounds of muscle yep. where you're gaining one pound of muscle per year, busting your ass. Yeah. Um, the uh, last question I, I have is you have a supplement company, Legion. What supplements do you recommend that are necessary for someone that is going to, that wants to gain muscle, that wants to get shredded? Is there, is there, I mean, protein to me is, is numero uno creatine. I know is pretty important. Anything else? Uh, all of Legion supplements, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no supplements are necessary, actually. I mean, that's from the beginning. I've been telling people that um, you don't need a protein powder. You don't need creatine. You don't need a multivitamin. You don't need fish oil. You don't need anything, especially if we're talking about body composition, because nutrition and exercise, 20% gives you 80, right? Supplementation is supplement, supplement, supplementary by definition, and it's part of that remaining 20%. Um, so my, my pitch has always been from the beginning, that's, that's, that's uh, the first thing that people need to understand. But if they have the budget, if they have the inclination, then I do think it's smart to consider including some supplements in the regimen, because if you're going to put the time and the effort into making the meal plans and training plans and following them, uh, if you could get Let's say, let's say body comp, right? Um, with a few supplements, if you could gain muscle, I think it's reasonable to say 15 to 20% faster, right? If you could do that by adding a couple of natural supplements, by adding creatine, beta alanine, um, citrulline, uh, betaine, might as well throw that in. A few things into your regimen, uh, safe, relatively inexpensive. If that is appealing, then supplements are for you. And if it's not, then that, you know, don't worry about it then basically. Um, so with that said, I would say the supplements that people should consider are a protein powder because it's convenient. That is really the reason why it's not right. because it's better than eating the eggs or the high protein dairy or the meat. It's just convenient, right? Um, you know, when it's 3 PM, I, I rather just mix a couple scoops of my protein and drink it down than like eat another chicken breast. Yeah. It's uh, hard to get all your protein if you don't. I mean, yeah, from my you could do it. You can yeah. do it. But you know, you may need to, you may need to start looking at like, you know, all right, eating 50 to 60 grams or so three to three in, in your bigger meals. So like a big breakfast, a lot of people don't like doing that though. So now, uh, you, you, you want to, you want to get probably at least three servings of protein per day to, to support muscle building. Um, there's evidence that, that more than that may be better, like five to six may be better than three, but the effect may not matter, but certainly three is better than one and two. We know that. Um, so when you start looking at, all right, if I'm going to do three, four, maybe five servings of protein per day, I need to eat like 200 grams or whatever. So that, that may not be enjoyable for, to, to, for, for people. I mean, I prefer again, to just have some, some protein. I'll have some meat in my lunch, some meat at dinner and otherwise, uh, powder works for me. And then of course there's, there's protein in a lot of the other plant foods that I'm eating. And that does count and that does add up, but the majority of the protein I'm coming is coming from animal foods because that is the most conducive to, to muscle building. So I'll have again, 50 to 60 grams of protein in both my lunch and dinner. And then, um, um, 
getting the rest from from powder, which is probably about 80 or 90 grams a day. And um, that works. And and if I were if I were getting, let's say, more, let's say two thirds, maybe three quarters of my protein from powder, a lot of people ask about that. That's not necessarily bad. It just though lean lean protein also provides it's a good source of of of, of nutrients like of minerals in yeah. particular right so i so I, I do eat meat for that reason there is nutritional value and also you're probably going to have stomach issues if you try to eat that much protein powder i know i would like i have uh three to four scoops per day and that's it even with my stuff which is as clean as it possibly can be and as stomach friendly as it possibly can be more than that is I start to get gassy and I don't like it. So yep. <laughs> that, that's, yep. that's, where, that's where I cap it off, right? Yeah, um, so, so the, the beta alanine, do you get that in like the pre-workout? Yes, drinks? and yeah, and, and that's, so in, in the scheme of things, the, 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 I put the protein powder at the top, then I would say um, vitamin D, fish oil, those should certainly be considered, those are very important nutrients, probably not getting enough in your diet alone, unless you eat a lot of fortified foods, but most fortified foods are very processed. So you're probably not if you're following my other advice. And if you're not spending a fair amount of time in the sun, which most of us are not, then you're not getting enough vitamin D and you need to supplement. Fish oil um, or an EPA, DHA, krill oil is fine. ALA is the, the plant um, option is not as great because your body has to convert the uh, the the, a, the alpha linolenic acid that's in it into EPA. Actually, I think it goes DHA and then the DHA and EPA. But that process is kind of inefficient. Um, but if somebody is is you know, vegan, then then they can certainly maintain health sufficiency with with a plant based uh, omega three supplement. Um, but unless someone is eating a few servings of fatty fish every every week, they're not getting enough EPA and DHA or enough omega three fatty acids in their diet. And by correcting that. Um, it's similar to vitamin D. I mean, it can have a lot of effects on, it can affect body comp. We know it affects muscle gain. It affects fat loss. It affects cognition um, and it affects sleep. It affects so many different things. You want to make sure you're getting enough EPA and DHA and that's, fish oil is a very easy way to do that. And, and then we have some body comp stuff. Then I would say creatine is a no brainer. If you're into weightlifting, um, you might as well because it's natural, it's safe, it's relatively it's, inexpensive yeah, it's and cheap. it works. Yeah, yeah, it works. And you're gonna gain muscle and strength faster. You're gonna recover from your workouts faster. It's just, it just makes sense. And then we have stuff that's found in, in at least good pre-workouts uh, like beta alanine, citrulline, betaine. Those are all in my pre-workout, which is called Pulse. And um, in, in the case of beta alanine, what we know is that it, it looks like it has two effects. One is it improves work capacity. So what you'll notice in your workouts, if you start taking enough beta alanine consistently, three to four grams per day, is you'll be able to get a couple of more reps with the same weight. That's what, you, that's what you'll notice. You'll have a little bit better muscle endurance is probably how you'd, how you'd describe it. And then it also appears to have uh, an, uh, an additive effect in, in muscle growth similar to creatine, not mechanistically similar, but, but the results seem to be similar in that it just helps you gain muscle faster. And scientists aren't even exactly sure why yet, but it does appear to do that in addition to boosting your performance, which of course, if you're willing to work a little bit harder now in the gym, then you're gonna gain muscle faster. If, if you are willing to make use of that additional couple of reps that you can, you can get, then you're gonna make a little bit faster progress. And citrulline, similar effects, although it doesn't appear to affect muscle growth directly. It appears to, it appears to just affect performance. It also uh, enhances blood flow. So a lot of people find that they have bigger pumps and that, um, that, that can actually have that can that can help muscle growth to some degree. It also just makes your training more fun. <laughs> so something to say, something to be said for that. And yeah. BTE affects power, so you 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 would experience it more in your lower rep ranges, uh, more strength. And again, if you make good use of that, you can gain muscle a little bit faster. And so if 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 you add, if you take the creatine plus plus those others, again, I think it's fair to say that you could gain muscle ten to maybe twenty percent max faster. Um, and if, if somebody, if you look at like what the average guy, so the average guy can probably gain about 15 to 20 pounds of muscle in his first year and about half of that in the next year and half of that in the next year. And it basically halves until it's nothing. 
And in women, it starts at about half that. So your average woman can gain probably 10 to maybe 15 pounds of muscle in her first year, half, half, half. And so if you play, if you kind of work that math and you go, all right, if I, if I train, if I, if I stick to this mostly well for the, for five years, six years, I'm going to get about as jacked as I possibly can get. Um, and if I could get there 15%, if we just cut it, cut it down the middle, if I could get there 15% faster, is that worth spending whatever it would cost per month? And many people go, yeah, sure. I like it. I'm into this stuff. So why not? I have so many more questions for you, but I know we're, we're, <laughs> out, of, we're out of time, Mike. Uh, I really appreciate your knowledge. You're seriously an encyclopedia, and that's why you wrote an encyclopedia on this <laughs> stuff, essentially. But uh, I highly encourage everyone to check out. You have at least 10 books. We were talking before we went on, and I think Mike's even losing track now. But there's Yeah, I stopped counting. I was like, oh, well, I'm always working on the next one. I, once yeah. it's done, I, I, and I have so, I have, I don't know probably seven more ideas. I don't, we'll see how many I can actually execute on, but yeah, I no enjoy wonder why you, Yeah, no wonder why you don't do anything else except work and spend a little time with your family. I mean, it, they, just, they take yeah. so much time. It really does. Uh, yeah. And I enjoy, I enjoy it, not complaining at all, but it's one of those things, whether it's researching or writing, I mean, like four hours can go by and you... You didn't even real like what that's it's been four hours and and then also oftentimes it feels like you get so little for the four hours you know what I mean like yeah. whether it's research all right I got to answer I got answers to a couple of questions or writing like I've only I've only put down a thousand words it's been four hours you know what I mean yeah well it's a, it's incredible what you've accomplished and I'd recommend everyone check out Legion I know you put a lot of time and effort into that and I heard you on another podcast just talking about. Your, why your cost of goods are so high because the quality that you put in there, you're not taking any shortcuts. And, uh, you know, that's what people, you know, if you're going to take supplements, make sure you're taking the right stuff because there's a lot on the market and there's a lot of junk out there as well. So really appreciate your time today, Mike, and, and all the knowledge you dropped. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, thank you for listening. And thank you, Mike, for being an amazing guest today. I really love this episode, as I said, to set it up. I think if you listen to this, you can have a jump start on your fitness journey. And definitely, I would check out Mike's books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, to name a few. We covered a ton today. I loved how we covered the spectrum of diet. We covered sleep. We covered working out. We covered cardio and a ton more supplements. What I love about Mike's approach to all of this is how pragmatic and simple he makes it. When you're looking at fitness and you're looking at getting in shape, I can't tell you enough how important it is to know what you are putting in your body. For myself personally, it does not matter how much I work out and my energy expenditure, even though that is a big calculation when you're looking at creating a deficit for yourself if you want to lose weight or you want to maintain or you want to even build muscle. That's an important calculation, but you have to know your body. For myself, again, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't seem to matter if I eat poorly, if I'm drinking beer, that all has such a huge compounding effect. You cannot outwork a bad diet. That all being said, start tracking your goals, start tracking where you're at, and then once you find that rhythm, you don't need to track anymore, but just stay on that. I think that's great advice. The biohack, we covered sleeping. Sleeping is the biohack, and I know I've been talking about this a lot, and you're probably bored of me saying it, but sleeping is so critical and crucial. And I can tell from a clarity standpoint, from a muscle building standpoint, when I went on this uh, this journey and I lost 20 some pounds like six months ago, I was thinking about everything I did right then. And I can tell you one of the things that I did is I made sure I was in bed. I was giving my time, my muscles ample time to grow. And I think that made such a huge difference. I wasn't even thinking a lot about it, but when I was remembering back then, like what did I do right and what could I have improved on? I know sleeping was up there. So there were so many other good insights on today's show. I'd love to hear from you as always. Thanks again for tuning in. Look 
looking forward to next week. I have some more amazing guests coming on and some news to share soon that you have to look out for some uh, event that we'll be hosting that is, is going to be pretty amazing. So with that, I hope you have a great week ahead. And remember, you, me, we are not almost there. <laughs>